It's funny. I think that when the press gets its hands on any novel by an African novelist, the tendency is to zoom in immediately on the politics, the socioeconomics, the sort of sociology of that place, of that state. Mm. And I regret this because yeah. I think certainly in my case and also in the cases of a number of other young, um, super talented African novelists, there's so much more to be said about the, the work than simply these remarks on the country or the countries in which it's set. Ghana Must Go is only a novel about a family. And that's enough. I mean, as anyone who comes from a family knows, between the problems between husband and wife, sibling and sibling, mother and father, parent and children, there's plenty there to focus on. And certainly that's what I've done with this book. Yeah. Ghana Must Go is by no means an autobiographical novel, although I sort of set myself up for that misinterpretation. Mm. There are innumerable surface similarities between my family and the Sai family, and I've explained that quite simply. With the truth, I wanted to investigate at the very outset of the writing process certain things of which I know nothing personally, and to sort of free myself up, to give myself more time, more space to do this, mm. I took as many details as I could from the lives of the people I know, just so that I wouldn't have to investigate them. Mm. So street names, building names, universities, towns, cities, countries, to use sort of these um, demographic details yeah. gave me more time to focus on the emotional ones, which is where the heart of the novel lies. Mm. So there are similarities and I would never seek to deny them, but for me they are surface. The writing process was um, both wonderful and miserable by turns. Mm. I started writing creatively, albeit badly, when I was four years old and waited a very long time for a story to arrive in my mind through my heart that was worthy of the form that is the novel. And when that happened, I sort of dropped everything and gave myself to the telling of this story. The first hundred pages came really easily. Mm in almost one contiguous flow, beginning in Copenhagen. But the next 200 really tried both my patience and <laughs> my faith because there was just this six month block, this gap between finishing page 100 and starting page 101, yeah. which I think in retrospect has to do with fear and being afraid that I, I wouldn't be able to meet the expectations of those who had shown great um, confidence in the pages that I'd written. I moved to Rome, I broke up with my lover, I changed everything that I could think to change and finally I was able to write again. The novel is broken into three parts, mm. gone, going and go. The second part, going, begins in the voice of Fola, the mother, yeah. who was without doubt the most difficult character for me to contend with. She was actually probably the easiest to write because her voice is so strong yeah. and so specific mm -hmm. that there was never any question of, is this the right word? Is that the right word? It's Fola's voice and that, and that never changed. But I think perhaps part of that block that I've described maybe was because I was hesitant to take on this character. Yeah. And when she started speaking, she never stopped. I wasn't afraid of my family while I was writing the novel, though I immediately became terrified of every single one of them the day that it was published. It suddenly occurred to me, yeah, I'm so clear that these are just surface similarities and these characters are not my family members. But the press keeps asking me this question, are, you know, will my family believe me? And the most wonderful thing happened when my mother first read the novel. My, my father read it all throughout its you know, creation, my stepfather also. But my mother and my twin sister only read it once it was bound and yeah. too late to make any changes. And I was so relieved that both of them said, I was afraid to read it, I put it off, mm. but now having done, I can say, in my mother's case, I am not Fola. I am much more glamorous, she said. <laughs> and my sister the same. Sadie's problems are the most superficial in a way, not to say that they're not meaningful, but they mm. live on the surface of her, of her experience, much more so than those of the other characters. And one of her greatest 
sources of shame and of hurt is, is, is her body and the way in which it does not approximate the beauty ideal mm. of the um, North American culture in which she lives. When, you know, it was always, I always knew from the very beginning, from the moment that these characters arrived to me, that Sadie would dance, mm. that Sadie would dance and in dancing find the interior of her body a space which she was having trouble accessing before. But it didn't occur to me, and I was sort of, um, in the first instance, heartbroken to find that this was interpreted in, w in a way that I think is a bit um, thin as Sadie going back to Africa, a mm. phrase which bothers me anyway, mm. um, to sort of find her primal self. I mean, first of all, she doesn't go back to Africa. She travels on a plane to Ghana, where mm. her father was born and, has, and yeah. has just recently died. So already, let's you know, be specific, she goes to her father's village having not known her father very well and having never seen this village at all. And she hears this music, which is not primal or tribal as it's being played in 2010, you know? It's mm. the music that we still yeah. listen to when I'm in, in Ghana. And she likes it. Mm. It's a much more simple, um, visceral and immediate connection i think than many readers are willing to mm. allow she just really likes it yeah. and she says it's you know it, it reminds her of the music that she listens to where she goes to do yoga and why shouldn't it yeah. it's just another form of music albeit one that has not been part of her experience until now and so she hears this music she likes it a girl asks her to come and dance and she finds as happens as happened to me the first time i encountered uh gujarati dancing in india that she knew what to do yeah. that she just got it and she really really liked it and in this moment it happens to be in ghana it happens to be uh god drumming that she's listening to but what is happening is much more universal and much more specific than just back to africa primal african identity yeah. blah 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 she's finding out that she's good at something mm. she's finding out that she loves her body yeah. at least she can be at peace with it in this space and that, to me, is so much more interesting and so much more complicated than simply Sadie discovering that she's African. Yeah. <laughs> At the end of part one, Kweku, who has been the protagonist of the novel heretofore, in dying, remarks that what he found in leaving Ghana and coming to America was a way to have his own story, mm. a story unhooked from the larger narratives, narratives of country and of poverty and of war that have swallowed up the stories of the people around him and mm. spat them back out as faceless, nameless villagers. Yeah. And I think that this is something that happens so often, especially in this part of the world where you, you know, as I've said, the tendency is just to paint the whole thing with the same broad brushstrokes that if the novel is about Ghana, it must be about civil war or poverty or hunger or, you know, cue the sad violins in the background and pick your tragedy and all this character wants and perhaps all mm. his creator wants to is a way to have a story that is human that yeah. is specific that is rooted in dishes and diapers and arguments and love making and love seeking and love losing and no more and no less mm. this is something that perhaps i've sought to do all my life as a person and as a writer and it's um it's a project in which I think Kwe Pusai and indeed his entire family is triumphant. Mm. In 2005, I wrote this article, Bye Bye Babar, or mm. What is an Afropolitan, considering the identity of a group of African people whose connection to some place or some places on the African continent is eternal, mm. and who also experience a very hybrid identity, a very global way, if you will, of seeing and of being in the world. I wrote this essay because I myself felt shut out from various identities, American, mm. British, Ghanaian, Nigerian. No one ever seemed to be satisfied by my claims mm. of being one or the other or a combination <laughs> of the four. And so I thought to myself, well, there must be some alternative that I'm missing. And Afropolitan was my way of conceiving of that alternative. In the essay, I describe a very simple experience, which is actually not unique to people from 
the African continent. Some readers have had a hard time understanding why Kwiku reacts the way he does to his firing, mm. his unjust dismissal. But no, thus far, no African, Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi reader has not understood this because there is something about, I think there is something about the immigrant project. Mm. I don't really love the phrase immigrant experience because there are so many of yeah, them, yeah. but the project, mm. leave point A, go to point B, because in point A, you didn't find enough space to somehow be who you wish to be. You mm. go to point B to find a little more space to do that. That project is, that project rests its point and its only justification, I think, is to succeed yeah. in some way. And when that doesn't happen, the devastation, the interior devastation can be insurmountable. Yeah. And I think what happens with Kweku, and it happens also with Fola, is that, you know, the idea that anyone that immigrates from a poor country to a richer one comes without a sense of pride is specious. I mean, Kweku is poor, but he's also proud. Mm. He also has a very distinct sense of himself and his capabilities. And when that sense is completely challenged, is completely rejected by the world in which he lives, by, by b the Boston, Massachusetts hospital mm. in which he works, he's unable to put himself back together again. And this comes, I think, from both his desperate need to succeed, but also the pride that he already had before he came to America. Mm. The pride that was his impetus to leave Ghana in the first place. When that is taken, um, little is left. People ask me all the time, do you think you'll go back to Ghana? Mm. It's a meaningless statement. Mm. One never goes back. One can't go back. My, my father, for example, was born in Gold Coast, mm. a colony which no longer exists. Mm. He left to pursue his education in Scotland. He now works in Saudi Arabia and he travels all the time to the nation state that is now Ghana. Mm. I was born in a London which will never come again, thank God, the London of the 1980s. And I return every year to visit my mother in a, in a Ghana that is changing by the month. Mm. And, and so I say this to say, one never goes back. Time moves on, we yeah. change, countries change, spaces change, and all we can do is live in relationship with where we are and what that place is as we discover it now. We can only see where we are through the eyes we have now. Of course, influenced by the, by the places we've been and by the people we've been, but most importantly, mediated through the people we've become. And so I, Taye, as I, as I exist today, I, I go to Ghana all the time. I go to Nigeria less frequently because it's a bit crazy, but you know, I go. I will travel across the continent for this project and I will do it as I am now. There's no going back. There's only going forward. I hate being referred to as multinational. I always say it yeah. sounds like a corporation yeah, that makes does. cheap yeah. clothes produced in China and sold in malls across Europe and America. And I think, <laughs> I can't, that's not what I am. That's yeah. what Zara is. Mm. So multinational has always bothered me. International, worse yet, jet setting doesn't um, accur accurately ref reflect my financial <laughs> situation. So multilocal. I thought to myself, this is what I am. Mm. I'm multilocal. My identity and that of my characters comes from, takes rise in different localities, different local experiences. Mm. My, the, the mercato down the street from my flat in Trastevere in Rome, or my stepfather's house in suburban New Jersey, my mom's garden in Accra, this is, these are the locals, these are the loci of my identity and of my experience. And so indeed, I am not multinational, but I am yeah. multilocal.